if we start the project, that problem becomes ours. We've just taken the ownership of that. So if the terms aren't right out of the gate, how are you going to have a leg to stand on? You have to negotiate that right in the front point. And if you can't have those conversations, you can't find your pumpkins in the construction world. You're listening to the Profit by Design podcast, episode 61. You work hard in your business. On the Profit by Design podcast, we ask the big question, what has your business done for you lately? Hi, I'm Dr. Sabrina Starling, the business psychologist, the author of How to Hire the Best, and your co-host on the Profit by Design podcast. Weekly, my co-host, Mike Bruno, and I bring you tips, tools, and strategies from our own experiences and from the experiences of our guests who are entrepreneurial thought leaders and real life entrepreneurs, all to support you in making intentionally profitable and sustainable business decisions to live the lifestyle you desire. Profit Designers, How to Hire the Best is now available on Amazon. You can get your copy at tapthepotential.com forward slash Amazon. I have been hearing from so many of you how this book is impacting you and how you've been sharing it with other entrepreneurs. And I so appreciate that. We are on a mission to get this book into as many entrepreneurs' hands as possible. So if you have already read the book, one of the things that you could do that would help this effort tremendously would be for you to leave a review on Amazon, an honest review. This review goes a long way to helping other entrepreneurs discover the book. Profit Designers, today we have Darren Virasamy back with us. Those of you who've been listening to past episodes know that Darren was our guest on episode 27, where we talked all about working from strengths and how important it is for us as leaders to be mindful of getting our team members working from their strengths. After Darren joined us on the podcast, 34 Strong and Tap the Potential teamed up And we offered a training to Tap the Potential clients called Leading Your Organization from Strengths. Our team at Tap the Potential participated in that training, and we had clients in there participating as well. That was a very successful training. And personally for myself, what I took from it is I became much more aware of working from my strengths. And I have seen in the last few months what I've been able to accomplish and just put out there has come from an increased awareness of where my personal strengths are. On the Tap the Potential team, we have been incredibly focused every week in our one-to-one meetings on what opportunities our team members having to work from their strengths. And I, as the leader, am mindful of taking things off their plate when it's not in their zone of strengths. And I've seen a lot more opportunities for our team members to get more involved in their areas of strengths. So I'm a big fan of the Strengths Finder and what it can do for an organization. Darren and I are going to be partnering again in the coming months to deliver Leading Your Organization from Your Strengths. It'll be delivered through Tap the Potential. And I hope that you will consider that as something for your team because it is such a powerful training. On today's episode, we will talk even more in depth about the importance of working from our strengths, but we're taking it from a little bit different angle. Darren is going to share some of his previous work experience as a team member, not a leader, but as a team member, and what it felt like to work in a business when the business lost sight of its sweet spot. Now, those of you who are familiar with how to hire the best and the tap the potential solution, we've been talking a lot about the importance of having a clearly defined sweet spot in a business. And when you're a team member working in a business without a clearly defined sweet spot, it does not feel good. And that's where we're going to head today. And we're going to contrast that with what happens when we do zero in on the business sweet spot, how that impacts morale, how that creates the opportunity for team members to, again, work from their strengths around the sweet spot of the business, which is 
key to creating a highly profitable great place to work. So if you're not familiar with Darren, here's what you need to know about him. Darren Verasami is the co-founder and chief operating officer of 34 Strong, comprised of a team that believes everyone deserves a great place to work and that any workplace can be great. A leading expert in the global employee engagement community, the 34 Strong team leverages the strengths-based approach to human development to create massive shifts within organizations, both culturally and on the bottom line. He and his team have created sustainable change in small micro-businesses all the way up to large organizational teams at the FDA, Bank of America, and the California Department of Public Health. Recently, Darren has keynoted for Hitachi Global Women's Conference, the Rotary World Peace Conference, the Professional Grounds Management Society, and author Mike Michalowicz's ProfitCon. Darren's 34 Strong business partner, Brandon Miller, is the co-author with his wife, Annalyn Miller, of a strengths-based parenting book titled Play to Their Strengths, which was published in July of 2019. So with that, let's dive into our conversation with Darren. Darren, welcome back to the podcast. Hi, Dr. Sabrina. It's great to be here. Yeah, we have some interesting topics to dive into. The last time we had you on the podcast, we talked all about strengths and the importance of working from our strengths and what that does to build team engagement. And with the How to Hire the Best Contractor Edition coming out, I wanted to bring you back on so we could revisit that topic but from a different angle today, because when you were with us last time, you talked about your past experience working in the construction world. And at the time that you were working in the construction world, you didn't have this knowledge that you have now about strengths and strengths finder. You didn't have 34 strong. All of that came later. And so I thought it would be a really interesting discussion for us to look at what your life was like on the team that you were on as you were trying to lead and manage team members and projects and what your experience was. And then let's take what you know now about working from strengths and look at if you could go back and do it differently, what would that look like? So maybe just dive in and tell us what was life like as a leader back then? Yeah. Well, it's fascinating because in my journey, I was so give a little context for the contractor world, we were predominantly a commercial construction company. I had many years in residential construction as well, new home building back in California. But for the time that I really want to focus on here was in the world of commercial construction, we were doing a lot of just basically in contractor speak, vanilla boxes, right? So we were going in, doing a lot of retail construction, and we had been working in different malls, different retail centers, and different things like that all across the United States. So what was fascinating in that space, there was one particular client, it was a cosmetics client that we'd work with, and we were doing all of their stores across the United States for probably about two or three years when I was first brought on board. And the fascinating part with this, Dr. Sabrina, is unintentionally, we had built the teams in a way that they were kind of playing to the strengths. So to break this down really simply, in that cycle, a project manager was a project manager and an estimator was an estimator. And this might sound like not that big of a deal, but it's a huge deal because project managers are really, really good at working the project, the day-to-day, once we've been awarded it, being able to take care of the issues, front play elements on licensing needs, getting the contracts together, making sure that the superintendent that's running the project has what they need and is set up and is blocking and tackling the issues that are out ahead. The estimator would be the ones that are going out there and estimating a lot of the work. And whether it was for this cosmetics company or even other work that we had, going through the estimating process, ripping apart the blueprints, really digging in, and managing a lot of that side. And they were really, really efficient and effective at that, at answering the questions or asking the right questions for clarification. So unintentionally, for my first couple of years in that role, as I was just a project manager before I I ended up moving up into a more senior project manager type role, what we were doing was unintentionally, we were kind of playing to people's talents. 
project managers were project managers, estimators were estimators, and we were running a pretty solid business. Profitability was very, very stable across the board with this particular client, and that was the bread and butter in the realm of pumpkin land that was a pumpkin for that respective season. So it was in a good place. Now here's the thing, about three years in, season shifted. That client had started to, you know, they had gone through a lot of their build out. So that pumpkin had gone through its harvest season. And I think this is an important part for us to remember as well as we're bridging the gap between pumpkins and strengths. But they had gone through a little bit of a harvest season. We'd done that. And as things started to change, Dr. Sabrina, what was fascinating was what had been our recipe for success. Project managers being project managers, estimators being estimators, that all shifted. The owner of the company decided, you know what? Estimators, you're going to be estimators and project managers. Project managers, you're going to be project managers and estimators. And you could just see people, their stomachs turning. Like, this is not what we do best. And what that did was it eroded accountability because I'm a project manager and I was responsible for fully estimating a project and then I missed something and then out in the field, you know, things were falling apart. It was easy to just kind of point the finger because nobody really knew who was accountable for what. And you see where this is going. Yes. We're about to have some runny eggs here, as Mike Bruno would say. Yes. So it got really, really messy in that space. And from there, we had a lot that we had to work through. And that became, for me, at the beginning of my need to transition out and to really think of a way of doing things. I did stick around for another few years because I wanted to try and get the team back to a place. But we moved from a place of high efficiency to a place of actual chaos. So I had the fascinating experience of going from a well-oiled machine where it felt like we were actually doing this whole strengths and engagement thing, which I didn't know much about at the time, to a place where we were just running sideways and not sure what to do. So that created quite a turn for me. So let's talk about your experience being a team member and being shifted like that, because you said your stomach started to turn. Mm-hmm. What were you aware of as you were being pulled out of something that was easy for you, that was enjoyable, that you were feeling success with? What was that like for you? Describe more of your experience as the team member in that. Well, it went for me, this was personal, but then it was also what you started to see on the whole team dynamics. It went from a culture where there was a lot of trust, there was clarity on who was doing what, to where it just felt like everybody was working a lot more and a lot harder, but not smarter. And the erosion came, for me personally, you start actually doubting yourself, you actually start not trusting in the decision making of leaders of the company at the time. I was a project manager, but I hadn't advanced to a senior leadership role. I was starting to kind of move up the ranks at that point. And I had been in contact with one of the vice presidents. The fascinating part was one of the vice presidents in one of our offices out in Texas and the CFO, the CFO was based in California with me as well. And I vividly remember going on walks with him and just kind of talking through things. And I remember a few conversations we talked about what happens if we spent, you know, a hundred thousand, it was, it had grown to a $20 million a year business, a very profitable business. And at 20 million, we asked the owner, you know, if we were to spend and actually hire two more people, hire one project manager and one estimator, as the sand started to shift and we were taking on more of these mega projects that were much larger than the smaller ones that we were doing, but had people continuing to be specialized, what would the return on investment be? And we were able to present that. And it's almost like we presented that. He said, that's a great idea. No, we're going to go the other way. So that just starts deflating you more and more and more. And there was also at times as well, there was some family and friendship dynamics with some of the members on the team that I didn't have, that the CFO didn't have. We were just working truly in what we thought to be the best interest of the company. The real pain point came, Dr. Sabrina, when we went from a $20 million a year profitable company to over the course of next year, we landed some big projects, but had started moving away from the realm of the cosmetics 
company that we'd been working in, thinking that we'd identified some new pumpkins. We grew that year from a $20 million a year company to a $30 million a year company. Now here's where it got really, really painful and where the shark tank ended up just going crazy. At $30 million a year, we were far less profitable than we were at $20 million a year. And when I say far less profitable, I don't mean in a percentage basis. I mean, we actually made less money, just cash that was kept in the bank, but we had run $10 million more through the business. We had barely grown the team at all, and everybody had worked so much harder. They had missed birthdays. They had missed family events because they were out on the road, different things along those lines, only to find out at the end of the year that top line revenue had gone way up. Bottom line revenue was massively threatened. Cash flow from certain clients that we'd gone after, the ways that payment terms had been structured, all that, had gotten sideways. That was incredibly painful. And I saw a team go from engaged to highly disengaged, lots of finger pointing. It didn't feel good. That's why the stomach turned in so many different ways. And the responses that people were bringing, it didn't seem like that was being fully listened to, fully taken into account and how we could get back to a place of really focusing on strengths and the power of actually having a team that's engaged. So I think we could have done a mic drop at the point when you said... 10 more million in revenue, less money in the bank. If we would have just stopped there, that's powerful. But then as you continued and you described what happened to team members and what, you know, the missed time with family and just all this extra effort that went into producing $10 million that sucked more money out of the business. And that is the common experience of businesses that grow without a clearly defined sweet spot. That's what you described there is we had a tight sweet spot. We knew what we were doing. We were working from our strengths around that sweet spot. And then what most entrepreneurs do, but especially in the construction space, chasing the revenue. That's exactly what it is. I vividly remember a flight I was going to New York we were going to meet with a large, large retail company that was going through a massive transition. They had different spaces that they were converting. And I vividly remember sitting on an aircraft, flying across the country in between the two owners of the company. It was a husband and wife team. And you had to sit in the middle? I didn't sit in the middle. I was walking through and they were debating and they were going through the terms and different things. And this all plays into business. And it was, she was presenting to her husband, hey, you know what? The way that this deal is being structured, it's going to set us up in a way that might not be the best for the business. We're going to have to hire up. We're going to have to put all of these folks and all of these assets out. But, you know, it's a large publicly traded company. The way that it was structured, Dr. Sabrina, and the way that the payment terms were structured, they wanted to get the stores effectively online and monetizing before the bulk of the payments were actually coming out to the contractors. Because as you can imagine, when their financials came out, that would look much healthier. So you're not just taking on all this debt going after, you know, remodels and all of those costs and incurring all of those. And I vividly remember sitting down between both of them and he was saying, now it's going to be fine. We can manage this. We can go through it. But the size of the company that we were just told him, Hey, we're not a bank, but effectively the more leverage that we're going here and the way the terms are structured in this deal, this is not going to work out very well for us if we don't hold the line. So we were prepping for our presentation to the CEO, again, of a Fortune 500 company. We were sitting in the room. Uh, we were one of the contractors that was being considered for this. And one of the things that was just mind-blowing through this is she completely got it. He was going back and forth. And it was more of the focus on the top line revenue. And my whole process of thinking, and I did stand my ground many times as I moved into the senior project manager role, that was a part that just seemed to be mind blowing to so many people, which doesn't seem mind blowing for me because I wanted to make sure that we protected the financial elements of the business. But what happened was we're going out there and he was so focused on that top line revenue, all of these financing elements didn't seem to hit. It didn't seem to hit the radar as to how 
painful that could actually be to his business and what could happen if they missed a payment and if we were so highly focused on this one that we had never worked with before. I also made this mention, which was simply this. Our only time to negotiate was before we set foot on a project. Once you've showed up on a job and you have taken ownership of we're doing the project, even if the terms are still being negotiated. This is something a lot of people don't realize, but in construction, sometimes people are starting the job before the contract's been executed. Oh, it's all right. It'll work out. We'll get paid in six years for a job that we did this year. It doesn't work out very well for you. So handshake deals, not a good idea. Handshake deals, especially with the terms of this. And they were really holding the line, Dr. Sabrina. You got to start on this date. You got to go through this. And we know all these nine stores opened by, or 10 stores, or actually it was more than that, but opened by this date. And they were really playing hardball. And the whole point is, it's you have a problem if the store isn't opened by that date, not us. And that's if we start the project, that problem becomes ours. We've just taken the ownership of that. So if the terms aren't right out of the gate, how are you going to have a leg to stand on? You have to negotiate that right in the front point. And if you can't have those conversations, you can't find your pumpkins in the construction world. And that's one of the things that we learned. Hurt. Yeah. So I want to underscore some things here. That is a powerful story. And what I really felt, my stomach was nodding up as you were talking because I felt- Retelling it. (laughs) Yeah. The pressure, 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 pressure from this large company promising you, dangling out there, the promise of big revenue coming into your company and the owners feeling like, I really want that. I really want that. We can bend, we can shift, we can somehow, we'll make it work. We'll pull it together and it'll pay off in the end. Meanwhile, what that really means is lots of sleepless nights for the owners, for the team members having to execute on this, for the person who's managing the cash flow and watching that, anxiety, stress, sleepless nights. And the point that I hear you making is we need to know who we are as a company before we're out there negotiating. We need to know our end game. We need to know what's most important to us. And if you're a profit designer, it's profit. That has to be at the forefront in any negotiation that you're going for or going into because it's so easy when you're in that pressure situation to lose sight of, I'm trying to build a sustainably profitable business here. This is our vision. These are our pumpkins. This is our sweet spot. And we need to hold true to that. And when we're firmly grounded in that, we are much stronger in those pressure situations. I couldn't agree with you more. One of the things in, again, in a decade of construction experience, both the residential and the commercial side, one of the most powerful tools that we have to remember as contractors is the power of saying no. And that comes only when you understand the profit design process, the pumpkin process of going through that, because you will have certain immutable laws. You'll have certain things. Yeah, this is not going to make sense. On paper, all of these projects were profitable. On cash flow reality, they were incredibly burdensome. And if you factor in interest carry and different things like that, if you're having to take out a loan, to actually do the project, which wasn't necessarily being factored in, even though we were ringing the alarm and the CFO were saying, hey, we got to look at these margins a little bit differently. And, and if things are being mandated towards us, okay, then we're just not going to start the project. Go find somebody else that's going to do it on these terms. And I vividly remember, I actually remember one time there was a project we were doing in upstate New York. We had, this is a client that had, we had done some work with, we were starting to build a relationship with and we're starting to do more and more stores with. They were playing hardball with me, Dr. Sabrina. And he basically said, hey, this was the budget that I've been allocated to do this project in. It was a mall in upstate New York. There wasn't a lot of contractors that were available at that time because there was a brand new mega project that was going on elsewhere. So everybody was in, on another project, another area. You have some projects that are union, some that are non-union. This happened to be a union project. The costs are a little bit more expensive on those projects. So he had bid this or he had budgeted it. This was the project manager on the client side, had budgeted it and said, hey, you know, 
this is only $150,000 that we have for this. You're going to have to do it for $150,000. I showed them all the bids that we have, how many people that we went out to and said, this project with us doing it basically at break even is $190,000 project. Showed them everything. And we did that. We'd had that. We was trying to force the hand and said, well, I'm just going to go have somebody else do the project, this and that. I said, go right on ahead. We had picked up the permit already. I said, I'll have a guy meet you. I vividly remember he was playing a game with me and he wouldn't call back on a Friday. And I had crews coming in from the Midwest to be there for a Monday start. It wasn't responding. And then I just called him. I left a message. I said, hey, if I don't hear from you by three o'clock, my crews are coming back home. I need a decision from you because I'm not putting boots on the ground and starting this project until I know where we're at with the contract. I got an angry phone call, but I got a response and we were moving forward with the project because it still, it didn't fall within line within our immutable laws. And this was not a project as a profit designer that we were designing profit into. We were trying to help the client out and show, hey, we got to at least break even. I can't pay you $40,000 to do a project because that's effectively what it was going to be. We can lose money by staying home and have a lot less stress, right? That's the way I always looked at it in construction. But I think it's important because the drive is always, we got to get more done. We got to do this. And that's just the nature of the industry. Call a timeout on that story. Ask where that script actually leads you as opposed to designing profit into it. Yeah. Well, and that's, you made a really interesting point as we were starting to have our conversation today before we hit the record button. And you said, you know, in the construction industry, the idea is that we're going to make it up on volume. Yep. That's a myth. That's a myth. It's a lie we tell ourselves, right? That's such a myth. I remember when I transitioned in that company into a senior project manager role, there was times we'd be sitting with the project managers and the estimators and we'd be looking and they'd see bids and we'd get an idea of where we fell in relation to other contractors. We'd get and they'd send your results. We wouldn't know necessarily who we'd bid against. They're like, oh, I'd have a bunch of our estimators and project managers saying, oh yeah, we got to get down to this rate. We got to get down to here. And we were never the bottom of the barrel contractor. Well, actually, a lot of our clients at the time were very, very high-end retailers. That's where I ended up doing a lot of work. Gucci, Saks Off Fifth, Neiman Marcus, all those types of clients were a big part of what we do. So we were a higher-end contractor. So when they were pushing for the bottom of the barrel bids, I had to stop the team so often and ask, why are we even trying to chase that? Because that's just not even who we are. Be comfortable asking that and looking in the mirror because we cannot provide the services that they're looking for and serve those higher end clients. It just doesn't work out. And you're not going to make it up on volume. You're actually just going to blow a hole in the side of the boat at an even faster rate because your losses just accumulate. They just keep going and growing. They just accumulate and growing and growing and growing. And that gap now becomes fire drills that we have to go in towards. And that ended up being a lot of the process. And one other point I want to make on this that I think is really, really important for listeners, because this actually happened to me personally, when we're thinking of talent and hiring the best, it's important that we hire the best and go through that cycle, but really get people to stay in their zone of genius, their zone of strengths, even while we're stretching them. What ended up happening to me, Dr. Sabrina, was I got really good at something I really didn't like to do. And the example of that is other projects would turn into fire drills. They'd go off the rails because people were set up for failure. An estimator was trying to project manage a job and the estimator wasn't set up for that. And I'd get called in to clients just over and over. This became my main role, became the firefighter guy. And I think we were a general contract. Last time I checked, I wasn't a fire marshal, right? But they're, oh, you're, you're going out, you're firefighting, there's this badge of honor that's worn in doing that. But I would ask the question, why are we having these fires? What's well, a function of training? It's a function of training. If the estimators are ever going to be successful on the project management side, let's spend a little more time on the front end getting them trained as opposed to having Darren step into these challenging situations. There was me and one other project manager. We'd have all of our own projects running and then get parachuted into all these other projects that were going off the rails to try to rebuild trust and save actual pumpkins. Some of our big pumpkin clients were starting to fall off the rails because that hiring piece or the talent alignment piece, there was great talent in what they were doing, but they were misaligned on the team. And that started actually attacking 
some of our pumpkins were, you had to go in and save that. I didn't enjoy that cycle because we were firefighting and my whole thought process was why fight these fires? Why not do controlled burns? So we don't have these fires and the controlled burns would have been getting, spending the time, roll up our sleeves, align talent, think of which roles people stay best in as opposed to just, hey, we landed work, you have a heartbeat, let's throw you at it and you're going to do all these things and that kind of happens and we weren't the only general contractor that I saw do that. Time and time again, I'd see our subs doing that and just years of experience with that. Yeah, it's rampant. So I just kind of to summarize where we've been, because there's been some powerful insights here that you're sharing, Darren. I want to pull it back in because you're hitting on some key points of the tap the potential solution for creating a highly profitable, great place to work that lets us business owners sleep at night in peace. <laughs> you know, that's the big thing, sleeping peacefully and not awake and worrying about cash flow. So Point number one, design your business from the outset to be sustainably profitable. And that means knowing what your sweet spot is, going through the full pumpkin plan process, not just the part of the pumpkin plan where you identify, I've got some bad clients, I need to get them off my vine, but the full pumpkin plan where you know your sweet spot and the sweet spot of the business, what the strengths are as of the team as a whole, what you can deliver on day in and day out and do it exceptionally well as a team and staying around that sweet spot with aligning team members' strengths around the sweet spot. So it's the business strengths, the team as a whole, and then the individual team members in roles that align with strengths. When that is happening, things hum along, and we have these highly profitable, great places to work. We know which jobs to go after. We know which ones to say no to. I loved the point that you made about knowing how to say no. That is so key. And that creates the profit in the business. That allows us entrepreneurs to really have a good lifestyle. And that's what it's all about is, you know, our lives as we're doing this work. So I want to pivot here because you are a part now, you're an owner in a wonderful company that we collaborate with at Tap the Potential, 34 Strong. We bring you in to support what we teach around aligning team members from their strengths in these pumpkin planned businesses. And we have had some of our clients and we at Tap the Potential have worked with you and we've gone through and we've done Strengths Finder, and you've really worked with us around leading our organizations from strengths. So you're in a completely different industry now, different business and you've you just built and built and refined your skill set and your knowledge. And you guys at 34 Strong are, you're going strong. Your business is really taking off because you're, you've worked, you've done some pumpkin planning. So I would love to kind of put you in the hot seat right now to talk about what your experience has been with pumpkin planning, like the first iterations of pumpkin planning in the business and what you've done most recently with it. Yeah, absolutely. So about, we're coming up into next year will be our seventh year in business and what we did, we went through the whole pumpkin plan process early in the business. And what's fascinating, like when we first started the company, you know, we were thinking, oh, when Brandon Miller, my business partner and I started it, we thought, oh yeah, we're going to go to real estate agents and we're going to do trainings there. And then real estate agents will hire us and then we'll, we'll coach them and go through. And what was fascinating was it started to reveal that wasn't actually a sustainable model. Because you're going in and you're spending the exact same amount of energy to close a micro deal that might be a $500 or $1,000 coaching package as you could if you invested in going to markets where there were actual business owners that were in there that maybe had a team that they wanted to get into and sustain. Then from that, we are in Sacramento, California, so the capital. If we wanted to work locally and start getting into the organizational consulting side, we had to learn the language of government and through some of the connections that, and the doors that opened, we started getting into that place. So that all happened in the first couple of years. So I give you that context because what started to happen when we did an analysis at about year three, what revealed itself, uh, Dr. Sabrina, actually between year three and four, I can't remember exactly, but what revealed itself was over 70% of our revenue was coming from just the government sources alone. 
that's what we'd gotten into. We were still thinking that we were putting a lot of resources into more of our private sector clients, but the bulk of it was coming from government. That was okay, but there's also elements, sometimes we started realizing as well with them, again, looking at the whole pumpkin process, yes, we were able to get into longer term contracts. Challenges sometimes with government, cash flow, payments, can't always pay retainer. This year, there was a season where 20, over 20% 20 of our revenue as of like the beginning of September had not been collected because we had had a particular challenge with one of our clients, or with a couple of our clients. That puts a lot of stress on the business. Thankfully, we've been able to resolve that and manage through. And because of the pumpkin plan and profit first, we managed through that without, you know, sinking the boat. But bottom line is these are things you have to start factoring in and in, in the process. So that was the initial cycle. And we committed from that, we want to actively work on reducing our lines of our reliance on just government. I'm happy to report that over the course of the past two and a half years, three years, we've done little micro iterations of checking on it, but we just came back last week. Uh, we were in Hawaii. We took our whole team to Hawaii to celebrate some wins that we had had last year. And we did a high level pumpkin plan analysis. Didn't even get fully into it, but just try to lay the context for how we're thinking of the business. I'm happy to report that over that period of time, we have our government contract base has gone downward to we're just over 40% in that area. So that's been a significant shift and other business lines have grown on the private sector side on some of those pieces. That's good. We've moved in the right direction. We've also started exploring, and I'm going to come back to this point in just a moment. We started exploring not only what are our traditional consulting boots on the ground type models where we're going in with organizations transforming cultures, but what are other business lines that are just better for us? For instance, the work that you and I have done together, that has been something that we've really started to kick off over the past year and a half or two. But looking at that as not just part of our traditional business of organizational development and consulting, but stepping into this is just a separate business line and thinking about it. So instead of it just being a pumpkin client, looking at it as a pumpkin field, right? Wow. I love hearing that we're part of your pumpkin field. <laughs> You're a pumpkin field. You're part of a different field from what our traditional even models are. And that's how we're starting to organize the business. So that's the direction that we got into this time. One final fascinating nugget that I had the privilege of drilling down into was we actually looked this time at our top 10 clients and the sources that they came from. And I broke it down, private sector, government sector, different sources that we came from. The cost of actually acquiring those clients it was fascinating. We've been a part of the whole Vistage world and going through and giving these talks and, and whatnot. What we broke down was for those top shelf clients that came from the world of Vistage, the cost of acquiring those top four, this is going to make your stomach turn, but it was about 30% of their revenue that they had generated. So the acquisition cost was incredibly high. We've still maintained profitability. We've been growing our profitability and in going through that. But it just got us as a team scratching our head, asking what is the real quality of this revenue? Because we, okay, just like everybody else had got stuck in the realm of, well, it's time for our rates to go up. Yeah, it's time for your rates to go up, but it's also time for you to look at what's your cost to actually acquire. So we did pumpkin planning and kind of really pointed it towards some of the expenses that we were going through. And it's not that those clients aren't going to be successful and sustainable as they fall now, but do we need to go through the same processes that we went to acquire those as new processes or is it time to really look at the whole vendor referral process from them and, and get into that level of the pumpkin planning place where we might not have been three years ago. So this is just thinking of the iterations of where we're at in the referral cycle and thinking of new lines of business as actual fields from what we've micro batch tested in certain elements. You know, that is such a very important point. 
you're doing deeper and deeper levels of pumpkin planting. And what really stands out to me is the blend of profit first with pumpkin planting. Because when we start looking at our costs to acquire a client and 30% of the revenue that comes in from the client going towards the cost to acquire, you start asking questions. And I hear the questions that you guys are tossing around is, are there other fields that where we can acquire clients at a fraction of that cost? And what does that do for our profitability if we put effort there? And when it's 30% of revenue, it's not just a cost of a monetary cost. Now we're looking at energy expended and time expended from your most valuable team members who are out there generating that business. So the leaders whose time is worth $10,000 an hour having to put exponential amounts of energy and effort towards a line of business takes away from energy that can go to other lines, other fields of business that are much more profitable and require less effort. That is so true. And the one final point I want to make on the field piece is I think it's really important for us. It's not any different than what happened in the construction world, but really put a bow around this for all the listeners. And we've kind of riffed on this. In pumpkin land, using the analogy of farming, tonight we're going to go to the pumpkin patch here in town. And it's actually a pumpkin farm that's not far from our house. But every year when you go there, the pumpkin field is not the same. One year where they were growing pumpkins, they go through the harvest of that. And then you go back next year, they're growing corn in that same field. And the whole point is that environment shifts sometimes. So we have to be able to look at our businesses and not just say that this is the pumpkin field. I'm going to keep planting the pumpkins here and growing it. Hey, that environment, sometimes the soil has already provided the nutrients. It's already provided the minerals to those pumpkins. We have to be able to look at our environments and say, these are the right seeds. This environment has shifted with this particular client. Here's why it shifted. They've been a pumpkin for the past three or four years, but there's things that might have shifted internally with them. This is part of what we went through as well. Are they really still a pumpkin or are they maybe not quite at that level? They're still going to be solid for us, but are there other transitions that we need to make? So it's important for us to kind of think about that as well when we're in the pumpkin planting process, because you can't keep planting the same seed in the same soil. You're going to deplete it. No. And so this is a huge point here, Darren, that we're making that pumpkin planting is not a once and done event. It is ongoing. There's different iterations of it. We have to pay attention to our environment, those environmental shifts. We have to harvest the pumpkins. We have to get the seeds from those giant pumpkins and take those seeds and go to another field with fertile soil and plant those seeds to grow our next Atlantic giant pumpkin. And so this is an ongoing process. And I, for myself, I think I've been pumpkin planting now about six years. So you're a little further along even than I am in it. And I have learned so much about the business. And if I had been working my pumpkin plan from six years ago, if I were still working that plan now, I'm pretty sure I'd be out of business. Like that is just not a viable thing to do. And Pumpkin planning, I've come to think about it as the pumpkin plan is a system for developing strategy in our business. And that is something we need to be upping all the time is our strategy. It's the process of, I think sometimes as entrepreneurs and just the environment that we live in, in our culture here, we can get into, I got this plan, I check these boxes, it's done. And we don't live like that, right? We have to eat every day. We have to get some exercise, right? We have to do all of these things and it's a regular basis that goes through. The pumpkin doesn't just grow and it's just, you know, done. The vines just die out. It's a continual process of, you know, sun, rain, and this whole cycle. And we have to make sure that we're going through that process. So with the pumpkin plan, it's not just with the name and the whole process. It's not just a function of it's a one-time sort of a deal. It becomes the lifeblood of your business and your culture as to how your team operates. And a big part of what we did on the retreat too was just getting the team looking at this and breaking the mold of this is our only line of business. So they're excited in actually thinking about this through the lens of 
oh, there's other business lines. There's other fields that we can look at. And we have proof that those are actual fertile fields. We've been batch testing this in different areas and thinking around that. Yeah. That's exciting. So I think we should let our profit designers in on the sneak peek preview of what we've got coming up because we've been doing some planning together. We've been batch testing. And so right now, here we are with How to Hire the Best Contractor Edition coming out. And in November, I'm taking those who want to be a part of it and who are signing up to go through the How to Hire the Best live course, which I have pumpkin planned. I have pulled out the pieces that I know work consistently for different industries that work, you know, like the no fail ingredients is what I'm teaching in the updated how to hire the best live course. And then with the new year coming and we all start thinking about strategic planning and we've got to, you know, what's 2020 going to be like, we are going to be offering pumpkin plan live early 2020 and kicking that off. So all of you profit designers, as you're listening to Darren and I talk about pumpkin planning and you're thinking, I need to do that. I need to get my sweet spot. I've been listening to that tap the potential solution. I need my tightly defined sweet spot and my lean and mighty team. So we're going to be offering pumpkin plan live. And then once those sweet spots are clearly defined, then you're in that position to really look at who's on your team and what are their strengths. And now let's align those strengths around that sweet spot. And that's where we're going to partner again. Tap the Potential is going to partner again with 34 Strong, and we will offer another round of leading your organization from strengths. That was such a popular offering with our clients. We went through it on the Tap the Potential side. We, our clients who did it, continue to talk about the takeaways and using their insights. We have one of our clients who is studying, I think, every day. He's studying the Strengths Finder and going deeper with the strengths and looking at his team and he brings insights to me that I'm like, wow, <laughs> you know, this is amazing what he's doing. So, but it's that impactful on a team and on a business when we have that really nice sweet spot and we have A players and we line them up on their strengths for what they're doing for our ideal clients in our businesses. So I am totally pumped, Darren. Me as well. I cannot wait. That's very, very exciting for what the future holds in store for us together. And just for your listeners, I cannot wait to do more work with them. As you can tell, I'm pretty passionate about the entrepreneurship side too. So getting a chance to work with businesses of this size, some of the direction that we've gone just gets us really excited. Well, and I would imagine too, from your end, it is easier to work with a business that has a clearly defined sweet spot. It is because that's part of what, you know, it gives them the target. So what are the talents that we need to align around? Yeah. Because it shows that there's also a focus on clarity of thinking and culture actually matters because if there is a sweet spot, it means that we're doing the work to figure out what's in our culture, right? Just with figuring out that sweet spot, you kind of have to define some of your immutable laws. You know? Yeah. So profit designers, stay tuned. And if you want to go on this journey with us in 2020 and you want to experience what this is like in your business to have that tight, sweet spot and A players working from strengths, stay tuned. And right now, the thing to be working on is working through the How to Hire the Best Toolkit where we're starting to talk to you about your immutable laws and just learning what you need to be looking for in your business to set it up to be attractive to A players, which leads right into the pumpkin planning that we'll be doing later on. So to get your hands on that toolkit, go to tapthepotential.com forward slash toolkit. And we will keep you up to date with all the great offerings coming your way. Is your business on track to being a highly profitable, great place to work? Take our assessment at tapthepotential.com forward slash assessment and find out now. Thank you for spending time with us today. Join our conversation in the Profit by Design podcast Facebook group. Share your thoughts on today's episode, ask us questions, and let us know what you want to hear about next. Visit our website at ProfitByDesignPodcast.com to access resources from our sponsors and tools we've created for you. Subscribe to the show on whatever platform you're listening to right now. There's a subscribe button right there. Go ahead and hit it so that you always get a notification when we release a new episode. And finally, share our podcast with a friend if you know a friend who would enjoy it. Thanks again for listening. This is real life business. Keep your chin up, 
keep moving forward. You got this. 